director of Silicon Valley Forum. Before we get started, I just wanted to tell you a little bit about our organization. So we are a 37-year-old nonprofit supporting the global startup and technology ecosystem. We organize oh, probably over 50 programs and events per year, including innovation programs and boot camps for startups and executives, program series for entrepreneurs, women in STEM, always with a focus on diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, we also do our annual Women in Tech Festival, which this year is in our sixth year. We will be doing it virtually on November 13th and 14th of this year. So please um, yeah, go to our website and register. And, and we would appreciate your support of this initiative. Um, you can find out about that and of course about all the other programs that we do, as well as sponsorship information. Um, please visit our website at siliconvalleyforum.com. We're also a very proud division of the Silicon Valley Organization, or the SVO for short. They show the same commitment to bringing together leaders and influencers. Um, they are a catalyst for business growth and a champion for a stronger community. They offer many resources and programs to educate and support your company and your startup. So I encourage you to find out more about them, membership opportunities, and about the incredible work that they do at the svo.com. And if you have any questions about how to be involved in either organization, I will leave that contact information in the chat box. So we are excited about today's program today as we are bringing back Allison Kvikstad from Elevist um, in part two of our Money Talk series. We have also brought back our host and moderator for this session, which is Debbie Rackin, um, the Chief Strategy and Innovation Officer at CSAA Insurance and also board member here at the SVO. So Debbie, I'm going to turn this over to you now. Thank you. Thank you, Denise, and welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us. Um, I'm super excited to be here for our round two of um, Money Talks, and uh, this is part of our, our Women in Money series at SV Forum, as Denise was saying, and super excited to be here again with Allison. Um, she's just a wealth of knowledge, and I think it's gonna be another, we had a fantastic conversation last time. More questions than we had time to get to, so uh, hopefully some of you are returning, uh, and we'll get to some of those questions we didn't get to last time, and for those of you who are joining us for the first time, uh, ask away, anything is fair game. Allison, um, I think it would be great before we dive into conversation and Q&A, if perhaps you could share um, just a, a little bit of background, and I know you have some statistics on um, women and the gender investment gap that might be good context um, and background for the conversation. Yeah, thank you. And I'm so, to, to everyone, I'm happy to be here again and spreading um, economic news, market news. I think um, financial literacy is so important at every stage of the game, every age, demographic, socioeconomic level. So I'm happy to be here and share what information I have. Um, uh, yes, I think, um, and I saw some, some men joining the group, which I think is great. Um, it says somebody has entered the waiting room, so I don't know if I have to do that, but um, I, I love, you know, men and women. I think what is key, and maybe I'll tie this into some of the stats that I have, Debbie, is that women and men are often socialized differently around money and the topics of money and the basic conversations that we have early in our careers all the way to right, thinking about things such as retirement. So the more conversations we can have openly about money, about budgeting, about the markets and economy, and hey, what are you doing? How'd you get that refinance, right? Those open dialogues, whether it's um, girlfriend to girlfriend or coworkers, um, friends, spouses, colleagues, and even to our parents or siblings or children, I think the better the overall economic environment is, and it, it provides a greater level of equality if we're all given that language that we can talk about money in an open manner. So what has been unfortunate is that women have faced, uh, and I think many of us know this, many women have faced here in the US and across the world, a pay gap 
right? Where we are making, it could be 80 cents to the dollar that the male equivalent has and has the opportunity to make. If we're a woman of color, it goes down even further, could be 40 to 60 cents of that same dollar. We all know about this, but what we're also facing is a debt gap, right? We tend to hold more in debt balances than our male equivalents and the investing gap. And that's really what LFS was started for, uh, I'm gonna say four or five years ago, in that it's addressing the gender investing gap. And so Debbie, I know you and I are like, well, well what is this? It is the fact that women come to the investing arena much later in life, right? Not in their 20s, not in their 30s, but on average at a much later point in our life. And when we do start to invest, it might be at a very um, smaller proportion, much greater, lower proportion than what the male equivalents would invest. And so, right, you're thinking, well, so what? Well, it hurts us exponentially if we are earning less throughout our careers we then are maybe leaving the workforce for different periods of time maybe to have a kid take care of parents take care of a spouse take care of a child right so many different reasons for us to leave the workforce and not contribute into our retirement plans and at the point when we do go to retire if we have invested less we have less to work with so there becomes this very big gender investing gap that we really are trying to address at the firm Elevest. I personally have 25 years of financial services experience, most of it in the very private wealth space. So working with people who have over a million dollars, but I've done over 10 years of financial literacy, helping those people living at or below the poverty level here in San Francisco and in San Jose. So I think the entire conversation around money what it means, how to get more, how to grow it is, is so great. And I'm happy to be doing it here today. Awesome. And women live longer too, on average. So it's a kind of a double whammy there. Six to well, eight years longer. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So one, um, obviously we had a massive, um, kind of a quick and the deepest ever economic kind of shock in March. And, uh, I can barely even remember back to March. It seems like an eternity ago. But, you know, so several months later, most of us are shelter, sheltering in place, you know, a lot of job loss, I mean, rec historic levels of job losses and some recent job recoveries. But what's your kind of current take on the economic outlook? Um, you know, how should we be thinking about that? Well, I think, it has been a whirlwind of a year. And if we think back to where we were in March and going county to county, state to state, right, with an essential economic timeout, right, where no businesses were gonna be, you know, in the same kind of operational level that they were in February or January, um, it was a big hiccup for the United States and for the global economy. Um, with that, we have seen a very quick rebound in the stock market. And so, you know, I want to make sure that when I'm saying stock market and economy and bond market, right, very different things. Mm -hmm. um, the economy has not yet fully recovered. So we've seen a very high level of unemployment week after week, right? It has subsided a tiny bit, but it is still quite a large figure in terms of those people here in the United States who are unemployed and filing for unemployment benefits. When we think about corporations and how they earn revenues and have profits, a lot of them really have had to shut their doors. And as we saw the uh, growth of the US economy in the second quarter, so the period ending June 30th, we got statistics on that that showed, um, if we looked at that on an annualized basis, it was about 33% decline. So a massive decline in the growth of the United States economy. The disconnect, and this is where a lot of people are then saying, well, wait a minute, aren't we less than 1% from the highs in the stock market if you're looking at the S&P 500 um, or looking at NASDAQ, which shows all the technology companies. The disconnect is such that the US stock markets are forward looking. So they are pricing in the recovery, the economic recovery, the 
recovery of the corporations, the revenues, the earnings, and that people will have jobs again. And is it 12 months, 18 months, 24 months down the line? But that disconnect is that's what that is essentially showing is that there is enough belief that they all the negative news or the majority of the negative news is out and that we will have a positive recovery at some point in the future. Who, whose guess, right, to what point in the future, Debbie, is uh, really at this point unknown. So in terms of planning and kind of taking stock of the information that we know, I think it is always prudent to, to really look at your investment profile and say, well, what am I investing for? What's the goal of this money? Is it short-term money that needs to be invested? Is it long-term money that needs to be invested? And then make some specific choices based on some of those time parameters. So um, I'm glad you started to get into that. I mean, one of the things that I was reflecting on, you know, for this conversation, and it's been a topic of conversation, certainly at my company is, you know, we've been all working from home at CSA Insurance Group since mid-March. And we thought we were going to go back originally in June, start taking people back to the office, and we postponed until um, the day after Labor Day, in, in, uh, I guess on the theory that kids would be going back to school and that would be well-timed. And now we've postponed again until early next year. But it, you know, it strikes me that women in particular have a complex and interrelated set of challenges, you know, because well, first of all, I think along with people of color, women, uh, I think are dis disproportionately affected by some of these job losses. Um, they tend to have a larger share of the burden for childcare and or household duties. And even more so perhaps if, um, and I'm obviously speaking in generalities uh, here, but, and even more so with, you know, kids maybe going to school virtually so there's there's a prolonged period of time where everybody's kind of working from home the sort of situation and then so there may be extra burdens or likely extra burdens for women in this particular time and we don't really know exactly how long this is going to persist and thank you for um beginning to put in you know some questions I'll, i'm, I'm going to tee up a few questions with allison here but we really invite you this these things are always better if they're interactive and you guys are lobbying in the questions as, as you have them. So please do that and I'll keep an eye on the chat window. But I, I guess, you know, you started to get into um, how people should think about investing. And maybe there's some things that are baseline concerns that, you know, would be good to talk about before people begin investing. But maybe we can begin to get in there um, and just sort of, you know, get to some practical tips that you may have for um, not just women, but everybody, you know, in the current environment. Yeah, these are, I, I think, kind of um, the, the initial steps, right, before you can go um, pass, go, collect. You, you really need to have some very baseline, kind of get your house in order. One is addressing debt, debt pay down, um, really focusing on if you have a high interest rate credit cards, you have higher interest student loans, you really want to tackle those and try to pay down debt as much as you can. I think the second most crucial thing you can do in terms of some, some basic financial planning ahead of investing is ensuring you have a budget. Um, we've often talked about, I know with Elevest and our planning um, resources, there's an 80-20 rule where if you're thinking about your take home pay, 80% here in the Bay Area because we live in such a high rent very expensive um, location, 80% of your take home pay would be going to your needs and, and wants, right? It has to take care of the shelter over your head, food, insurance, and then 20% would be targeted towards your future you, right? So whether that's through uh, 401k, IRA, looking at your home, some type of investment in your future. If we lived in other areas where maybe rent isn't so expensive, we could think about more 50% going to your needs, wants, 30% maybe for some discretionary um, lifestyle additives, and then 20% to your future you. So that's really, I think, imperative before you go forth and start investing is have your debt pay down, have that budget set up, and then with that budget, make sure you are slowly you know, addressing if you don't already have an emergency fund 
right, which is cash. It is not an investment account. It is cash sitting in a checking account or a savings account, but it should be a very minimum of three months of your living expenses. I'm a single mom raising a son. I would think in my case, it's somewhere between six to 12 months because um, stuff happens to me. As I told you, I had an injury over the weekend, right? Stuff happens. If I'm now not able to work, I need to make sure I have a longer runway or cash to draw upon if I'm not going to get paid, if I had the type of job where I wasn't going to be able to collect my salary. So um, again, I think that is crucial. Not enough people in the United States have that emergency fund. It might be hard to establish at first, especially here living in the Bay Area where rent mortgages are so expensive, but it is something that if you, if you can and you've addressed debt pay down, then to build up that emergency fund three months, six months. Um, I made a career change a few years ago. I made sure I had rough, roughly 24 months of a cash flow in terms of an emergency fund just there for my needs. Wow, that's amazing. So, you know, one of the things that strikes me, going back to a comment you made earlier, and I'll just um, remind people, please uh, uh, log in your questions into the chat window, and I will make sure I keep an eye on that. Uh, otherwise, you're stuck with questions that I come up with. <laughs> so um, help me out with some better questions. So I'm thinking about, you know, what you were describing earlier about kind of the, what seems to some people like a disconnect between the, you know, at all time highs in the stock market and, you know, obviously economically, um, you know, the, the, the picture is very different. A lot of people are on furlough or they've lost their jobs or, you know, they're worried about losing their jobs, whatever the case may be. Um, it, you know, one question people might have is, is now a good time to invest? Um, I, I've, you know, to the extent that I keep an eye on, you know, the, the financial news and, and, you know, reading around that. I mean, some people, I think I saw something with Jim Cramer, the mad money guy, uh, you know, talking about like, now is the worst possible time to invest because the stock market is, you know, way too many people are rushing in. What, what is your view on that? I think this goes back to one of the comments in terms of what's the money for? What's the time horizon that you have? There are studies that say, you know, if you have beyond a 15 year time horizon, um, no point in time. And I think this Oppen I think it was Oppenheimer who did the study, um, the Oppenheimer funds that any 15 year consecutive period, you would still have had a positive return, right? Well, a lot of people don't have 15 years. They're coming up on retirement five years, six years down the line. So then you get to a point of really asking yourself, what is the money for? And I think with investing, it is crucial to have a plan for, okay, this is short-term money. I need it in two years, or it is long-term money, retirement money, and I'm not going to need to touch it for 20 years or 25 years. If you have time on your side and you have that long of a runway or that long of a time period to invest, you have the ability to make up if there are losses in the market. So I think to, to Jim Cramer's point, the better maybe commentary would have been, you know, specific to one individual, if you're gonna need that money in three to five years, maybe you don't invest 100% in the stock market. Maybe it's at a much smaller amount that you're investing in the stock market. Mm -hmm. This is what I think, and Debbie, I think you and I shared is, I had spoken to a couple of women and in regards to their 401ks, and these women are in their early 30s, and they have all cash in their 401ks. So to me, the, the question, you know, I came back to them with, are you going to plan on taking this money, touching this money, living off of this money for at least 20 years? And the answer was no. So in that case, they should still be investing in the stock market. And, you know, one of the, the things that you kind of alluded to, but might be worthwhile going over is um, thinking about your goals and goals occur in different time horizons, which obviously has implications for, you know, how you think about whatever, you know, you were talking about the difference between a three to six month rainy day fund um, versus two years of one because you were making a career right. um, transition. Um, you know, what, what are some maybe broad sets of thoughts about goals and time horizons that might be helpful to people in terms of how, to, this is a really weird, I mean, a, a more unusual time than perhaps any time recently that I can think of, 
in terms of the degree of uncertainty. Uh, you know, I noticed uh, um, Ron was commenting in the chat window about the stat we gave earlier around the almost 33% GDP contraction, you know, that occurred in Q2, which is an annualized thing. So it was annualized, um, right. you know, it's probably not going to be that deep of a contraction in terms of where we end up this at the end of this calendar year. But it is relevant from the perspective that it's a very deep contraction. Millions and millions of people have lost jobs and that will just naturally take time to get back to. But, you know, what, what kind of broad guidance would you give people in terms of thinking about their, their goals short term and long term right now? This is one I think, you know, it goes back to every individual is going to be maybe at a different point in their career, different point in their um, salary trajectory. Are they moving up the corporate ladder or are they getting to a point where they're looking to um, pivot, make a career change? And I think some of this as it goes to planning is being a little strategic, right? If you're at a position where you have been furloughed or you're making less than you think you know, is competitive, is now the right time to jump ship? Given what we're faced in the economy, you may want to be a little more conservative with some of the shorter term planning because there are such amount, a great amount of unknowns. Um, that said, you know, I'm still a proponent always asking for a raise, always asking what can I do to get to that next step. Um, that helps you with your current job, your current position. I'm always also of the, the fan to network and network some more and network some more. Um, I've shockingly had people call in this environment and say, you know, do you, headhunters call about other positions? And so, I know there are jobs out there and you have to be a little strategic in making, you know, what are the goals that you have for the next one year, two year, three years, um, as it relates to your current job, as it relates to investing. This is one where we have more people today saying, you know, I'm considering looking at, I'm considering purchasing a home. And that is a big step and it requires in many cases, a good size down payment, right? So you're taking cash that you may have had, in investments, you may have had in an emergency fund, you're putting it into real estate, maybe to live, maybe to use it as a real estate um, income property. And with that, there is a level of risk with that if you don't have job security, if you or, and or your partner, right, are moving into a piece of illiquid assets, a real estate that you don't have job security. So that's something also to consider. But from that standpoint, you know, you outweigh the pros and the cons. And if you do have a level of job security, home ownership can be a wonderful thing. It can provide you with, you know, some, maybe some degree of tax benefits. And it could be an asset, although not an income producing asset, if you're living in it and you're not charging rent to others, um, but is an asset that you can actually enjoy. And maybe this provides, this being this pandemic, provides some level of opportunity for you to get in because interest rates are so low. So yeah. as you think about goals, this, this is where I would think really you look at, um, you know, what is it specific to you and what are your goals one year out, three years out, five years out, 10 years. Of course, that's going to change, but at least having some roadmap helps you make decisions along the way. Yeah, that's helpful. Thank you. Um, we did have a question come in from Letitia Robbins. Uh, her mother-in-law told her the national average for interest rates is 2.8%. I'm assuming on a 30-year. I current she currently has a 3.5% rate. Should she look into refinancing at the time? Is it worth the effort? Yes, yes. I just did this myself, um, and I got back a quote for, I think it was 2.95 also from a 3.5% yeah. 30 year fixed. If you wanna be more creative, um, you know, people are looking at seven and one, right? So an interest only for me, I'm, I'm a little more conservative, more traditional. I'd like the 30 year fixed mortgage or a 15 year fixed mortgage. If you're going with a 15 year, right? Then you're gonna have more cash out of pocket every month. Mm -hmm. um, so it really, again, depends on someone's underlying budget, but definitely take a look at refinancing, make sure the underlying banks right now are very competitive. So I would suggest shop around, make sure you understand what the 
fees are, if there are any closing costs, if there are any points. I know some financial institutions are really giving some great deals out. Right, and if you are um, more risk averse, you can go with the, the like a 30 year fix, but you can always pay more every month if you feel right. like, and you end up paying off your loan faster um, and without the risk of a 7-1 um, adjustable rate mortgage uh, and that kind of thing. Really depends on what you want. Um, you know, when we were getting ready for this, we talked a little bit about um, how confusing it may have been recently, sort of shifting back to the stock investing. There's been a lot of regulatory changes and proposed changes around fidu the fiduciary rule as it relates to investors and people who are either brokers or investment advisors. Maybe you could talk a little bit about that. I, I personally find that that's an area that is just generally confusing to people. And then the fact that the rules kind of keep changing or being threatened to change uh, might add to people's confusion. Maybe you can clarify. I'm, I'm happy to. I think I, I end up discussing this at least once a day. Um, there is a big difference. And so let me take a step back. When people say a financial advisor, typically they are referring to someone who is offering comprehensive financial advice. And then you'll hear someone who is a certified financial planner or a broker or a registered investment advisor, right? All of those different names can really kind of mean the same, a wealth advisor, a financial advisor, right? So what you really want to know is, is that person, um, how are they regulated? What securities licenses do they have? Are they, and this is, I think, the, the very, to your point, Debbie, the very most important key aspect of this, are they a fiduciary? And by a fiduciary, it means that they are bound to provide you with advice specific to you that is the best in your interest, not their own firm's interest, not their other 30 clients' interest, but really what is in the best interest for you, the client. They should be taking an effort to understand everything about you, right? The needs that you have, your spending, your risk tolerance, your time horizon, they should be asking about your goals and then helping to devise an investment plan or a financial plan based on your goals. If they are then selling you products or services that are um, right right doing not doing right by you so this is something where if you're interviewing underlying advisors you want to understand are you a fiduciary broker dealers in the traditional sense typically were those who were giving you advice on securities to purchase or sell and what has happened and i think debbie this is to your point is um we got some new rulings last summer and you know changes to the entire, the entire, the, oh, I can't even say that, um, the entire financial services industry that talks about shifting broker dealers and their goals and making it more like the fiduciary rule. So it is, it is moving in the right direction so that all broker dealers, registered investment advisors have to adhere to this fiduciary rule, but it is not foolproof yet. So it is one where if you're investigating, if you're trying to find a new advisory person, firm, you really want to ask that bottom line question is, are you a fiduciary? Are you bound by a fiduciary duty to act in my best interest, period? And um, so kind of uh, maybe building on that, there are a lot, there are many, many more tools and apps and um, ways for people to invest these days than even were there, you know, um, kind of around the time of the financial crisis a little over 10 years ago. There are the robo-advisors. There's all sorts of interesting innovation happening in the space, actually, which I just generally pay attention to because of my role. But, you know, like uh, I think Schwab recently came out with something called Slice, which I assume is targeted maybe at some younger demographics which I, I guess theoretically you could buy a slice of a stock instead of the uh, one share of, of the stock or more. Um, what, what are your thoughts for people who want to go it on their own? So maybe without an, an actual human advisor with things like um, Wealthfront or Betterment or um, which are two of the robo 
CEO advisors and or things like Robinhood, which is an app you can buy and sell stocks theoretically for free. Um, almost like really easy to do, but maybe too easy right. to do. Um, it's a great question. So in the financial services industry, right, you have that traditional broker-dealer relationship. You, Debbie, could pick up and, hey, I want to buy Facebook, I want to buy Coca-Cola, and that person could help you buy or sell that. What more and more people want to do is have a more comprehensive investment plan. And they're able to do that in a very cost-efficient way through a robo-advisor. So what's a robo-advisor? It is a, a company, registered investment advisory company that allows you to use software software algorithms to put in all of the specifics about you, Debbie. You're 25, you make $100,000 a year, you don't have a mortgage or hardly any debt, right? And your goal is to grow your money by the time you are 50, right? Or it's a build wealth. You can, you can set up whatever goal you want. The software algorithms within Vanguard, Fidelity, um, Schwab has an advisory service, Betterment, Wealthfront, Elevest, Right, we'll take all of those inputs and then give you a allocation that is specific to that goal. Right, okay, for you, Debbie, it's hypothetically 70% stocks, 30% bonds, and it will help you in underlyingly like invest that money. So it doesn't just make the plan for you, it takes it in a next step and actually invests it for you. And then it may have rebalancing that happens quarterly, monthly annually to still rebalance and get you to that target. Those are great in that it provides people with an easy way to get invested. One of the, I think, hurdles is often they may have um, high minimums, right? So it could be 5 million or 10, or excuse me, 5,000 or 10,000 to get invested with them. In many cases, you've seen Wealthfront, Betterment, um, lower some of their minimums. Elevest, we have no minimum. Charles Schwab, and I know even Vanguard have them as well. I like them because they offer that service and it's very low in terms of the cost. So it is not prohibitive for someone who's starting off with, I just have $1,000 to invest, or I'd like to put $25 into an investment account per month and have it grow over 20 years or 10 years. And maybe that 20 Five dollars is what I used to pay to I don't know, Starbucks, right? Or a Manny Petty. I'm no longer ready. I want that money invested. It helps you do that in a way that is pretty cost effective. That said, those are the types of robo advisors that are giving you very diversified mix of assets, meaning a broad mix of stock market exposure and maybe a broad mix of bond market exposure. The companies like Robinhood give you the ability to um, actively trade in, I want to buy Tesla, I want to buy Apple, right? You're picking and choosing underlying companies or industries, sectors, and it is not often, so I say often, I'm generalizing as well, as not often done so in a manner where you get to invest across the broad stock market. So it is a bit more um, betting. And I would say in that case, are you someone who very articulately, accurately knows that industry and is investing with the best knowledge? If, you know, if, if that's your day job, great. Um, I think we've seen some statistics on companies like Robinhood over the last three or four months, and we've seen a lot of people have lost money um, picking and choosing, right, some of the underlying companies that they thought would do well and maybe haven't yet. It's a, it's a more volatile way to play the stock market. Yeah, I, I've, I've heard recently that Robin had added some incredibly large number of accounts just in the last few months, like millions of accounts. And it's very easy to pick individual stocks. It's so easy and almost gamified and fun that people are doing no research and you know, consequently sometimes making maybe ill-advised investment decisions. Um, Debbie, it's a lot like what we saw, though, if you think back to, I worked in the dot-com era. I mean, it's a lot of what we saw then. People were running to, I want to own these tech names. Yeah, yeah, exactly. You know, you mentioned, uh, you sort of alluded to asset allocation there a moment ago, and there's that, like the traditional 
advice is. And by the way, I'm coming up with questions. So, but please, if you have them, please jump into the chat window and I will keep an eye on that and ask uh, your question to Allison. Um, so asset allocation, so the traditional kind of split, you know, might be 60% in stocks, 40% in bonds. You just use 70, 30. Um, I guess a couple of two related, separate but related questions. One is, you know, is there a generic asset allocation that makes sense for most people? And secondly, how should we think about bonds? I mean, we've been talking a lot about stocks um, and this era of uncertainty. Um, stock market has been performing very well, as we've alluded to, but how should we be thinking about bonds right now? It, they're both really good questions. I would say from the, the point of asset allocation, right? You your ask determinant of your returns over the long period of time. So if you are consistently with a 60-40 or 70-30 and you're always rebalancing to that, right, that's going to have the greater, in, in most cases, if we look across the average and look at statistics, that will be the greater determinant of your returns versus Coke versus Pepsi or, right, Apple versus Facebook, right, making those kind of, of tactical buys and sells, as well as if you're timing the market, getting in, getting out, getting in, getting out. Having that consistent asset allocation, right, is the much better way to invest over a long period of time. That said, there is no hard and fast one asset allocation that is for everyone. I have worked with um, multi-generational families, women in their 90s, and they have me invest their money, right? Not for them, but for their grandchildren. And so with it, even, it's, even though it's their trust, you would think, oh, we would maybe not have as much in equities and stocks. I am because I'm investing maybe for the younger generation. Um, on the flip side, I have had people with um, over $10 million in their mid thirties have no appetite for risk and only want bonds because they can't stomach the volatility of the stock market. They've made enough money or amassed enough wealth that they simply don't wanna invest in anything that is volatile, like the stock market. So Debbie, there is no hard and fast rule for everyone at the age of 40 should have, you know, X percent in stocks and X percent in bonds. I think it truly matters what is the time horizon of those goals, what's the money for, what is your specific risk tolerance, do you need income? Do you need growth? Right? All of those factors really play. Mm -hmm. um, and then you asked another question. Bonds. Bonds have historically paid, played a big component in most of my clients' accounts. Uh, we live, I live in California. Most of my clients have lived in California where they have had um, pretty high taxes. So having an out of their assets in California municipal bonds has played a big impact in my clients' accounts. It has one provided a level of stability, right? Where their stocks are going up and down, up and down wildly, depending on the year. Um, the bonds pretty much have stayed stable with some exceptions. We did see a lot of volatility in the bond market in March. No surprise. Um, everyone really thought the sky was falling. So most asset classes went down to a great degree in March. And then as we've seen, come back up. Bonds today, especially if we're looking at the treasury bonds, 10-year treasury bonds, pay very little in terms of income or yield. Um, so there are corporate bonds, um, you know, municipal bonds for a specific municipal bonds for a specific investor if they're still in a high tax bracket. So it's not something I can say for everyone on this call. Yes, you should own California muni bonds or yes, everyone should have, you know, corporate bonds or treasury inflation protected bonds is really going to be individual yeah. to individual. Well, and it, I'm mindful too, to the extent that you, someone has a diversified portfolio with whatever allocation of stocks to bonds, um, the, you, you quickly mentioned the um, rebalancing. Um, because the stock market has been so hot, um, first of all, for the 10 years leading up to this most recent economic crisis, 
um, uh, and, and even probably since, because the market's gone, continue to go up again, um, you can get out of balance from whatever your target asset allocation is really quickly. So it is very important once you figure out what the right allocation is for you to kind of keep an eye on it. Um, I see we have some questions coming in. Um, Denise has asked, did we discuss the rule of 72? Do you know what that is? I do. I <laughs> did not um, discuss, and it's basically that your assets, you would take a, let me get the, you want the exact, um, that your assets basically double within a certain period of time and you divide that by the 82. But I will get the, um, the exact calculation for you. We also have another question coming in as well, if you want to do that one later. That rule of 72, how long your investment takes to double given that fixed mm -hmm. rate of interest. So, you know, if you're thinking nine years, right, or eight years, divide that by 72, that's gotcha. how many years. Um, how, uh, let's see, AJ Elias asks, um, how critical is it to have life insurance and or a Roth IRA to diversify the portfolio and have tax-free access to some of those retirement funds? Those are great questions. So the life insurance, I think, is, is another one where it is, um, I can't say every person that I've met or worked with has had a need for life insurance. Sometimes people have enough money and everything that they have is liquid, meaning they can turn around and sell it and get cash for it. So um, it is often for the clients that I've worked with where they have a lot of illiquid assets, meaning real estate. And if they were to pass, they'd want their spouse to have access to easy cash. So that's where I've seen a lot of people work with insurance. Um, myself personally, as a single mom, I have life insurance, but it is not used as a savings account. It is simply very, very simple policy where it's term. I die. There's money that pays off my house. My son has money for college for the next few years, and that's it. I need him to get a job and, and get back to you know, his life after some reasonable mourning period. So it is something that is very specific to each individual. I would be somewhat leery of some type of insurance policies where there are heavy fees associated with the type of policy. Um, you know, and with this, I'm referring to sometimes annuities where they do give you income at a later date. There's a lot of, um, details in the contract and deep, you know, we in the weeds that you really want to understand what you are getting and what you are paying for and what access do you have to that money at a specific date. And if you pass, are there survivor benefits? So the, the question about insurance can go, we could have an entire hour long conversation about that. Uh, Debbie, what was the second question? Uh, that, uh, the question is, oh, the Roth IRA, IRA. Yeah. Yes. for tax free. Um, Yes, I love those. I think if you are, are within the um, taxable income and that you, you qualify to put money into a Roth, yes. I've seen many times people earn too much money to get a traditional Roth IRA and they do what is a, called a backdoor Roth. So they fund into their 401k, convert from the 401k into a traditional IRA, and then they convert that into a backdoor Roth, meaning they are paying taxes on the conversion on that year, then allowing that Roth to grow for a period of time. So when they do hit, you know, 60, 65, they're not having to pay taxes on it. So some of this is when you think you're going to have to pay more in taxes. Is it today or is it in five years or 10 years? One never knows depending on what government we have and will we have lower taxes or not. Yeah, and um, I guess different from what we were talking about earlier with a registered investment advisor or a broker, some of, as we get into some of these retirement accounts, it might, might be beneficial to talk to a tax uh, specialist on some of those. We have another question kind of related from Teal Dunn. Um, do you recommend maxing out your 401k first or would it be better to put the money into an index or mutual fund instead? 
So this is kind of going back to the budget. I would, I would normally say, yes, definitely max out your 401k. If you are uh, under 50, you can put 19,500 into most 401ks. If it's a government entity, it might be different or a nonprofit, right? But if it's a traditional company, 401k, you should have the ability to put 19,500. Right, that said, I've had a couple conversations with some women over the last week and they were making roughly $70,000 a year in salary that would be a large percentage for them to put away. And it would really prohibit their ability to pay the rent, pay for food, pay for insurance. So some of that goes into, while it's optimal to max out your 401k, you have to really look at your overall budget. Can you afford to do it? And so with that, um, the question is also, are you saving for, and what's the money for? Is it for long-term or are you in a position where maybe you want to have a build wealth account, right? You want to invest for two years or five years so that you can have a house down payment or, or something else. In that case, right, if it's not truly just long-term investment money for your retirement, then, then you could certainly set up a different investment account and buy, like you said, a, a you know, well-diversified exchange-traded fund Mm -hmm. or mutual fund. Okay, great. Well, I got a question privately that I'll ask you. I think it's a good one that a lot of people might be interested in. Um, are there any financial books you would recommend for, say, a young woman, mid-20s um, to invest? So like you're new to this whole thing, what would, are there any books that you might recommend for those folks? Um, um, Jolene Godfrey, uh, she has some great Dollar Diva books. I would say that the Susie Orman books, I've, I've read some and there's a lot of shame in some of those. And I, I think there's so many feelings and emotions already around money. I, I wouldn't want to recommend reading something and have someone shame you out of buying something. So um, I think her, her plans are very mm -hmm. fundamental. And as it relates to planning, some of the Susie Ormans, and she gives, I think, good context of what the um, terms mean. I would say our website, Elevest, in the magazine section, you don't have to be a client, but it's free. It is very useful information, very accessible. There are white papers there. There are, uh, you know, commentary that says what's the difference between a traditional Roth and a, you know, a traditional IRA and a Roth IRA. And it shows you really the calculations between the two if you're trying to really do the math on what makes more sense for you today mm -hmm. in 2020. Mm -hmm. um, also, should you max out your 401k, the question we had before, it shows you the tax ram ramifications if you do put more into your 401k, how you essentially can save some money on taxes. So I know our website, LOS.com, in the magazine section, really has a lot of content um nerd wallet is a website i think that gives you some great insights in terms of money management and tools and is also free so i'm i'm you know often rather you you get as much free the websites that you pick any company i think most of the financial institutions have free content yeah, for you it's amazing actually maybe that's part of the problem there's so much good information out there that's free where do you even begin? But I, I have to, I have to second that remark, and uh, it's, I, I, it's not intended as a shameless plug, but I do think the content on LMS is actually really good. Um, we tried. We, we don't want to dummy it down, but we get to the point where it. I think the entire world of finance can be a language, and so if you don't know what a stock is and you don't know what a bond is, right? You want to be able to understand that without having to go five other, you know, clicks down a website. So if something can be explained in a very accessible way, you're more inclined to actually kind of um, retain that information and be able to move forward. So often we are waiting and not investing because we think, well, I need to know everything about an investment before I actually invest. Um, that's what's holding back a lot of women. Right. So I, I feel compelled to ask this question. It's kind of in the vein of, you know, maybe some of the innovations like, robo 
advisors and Robinhood apps and things like that. But this is more around crypto, and you know, there's a there's a variety of different um, kind of cryptocurrencies, you know, Ethereum and Bitcoin, but um, probably pretty speculative. But what, what would your advice be or just commentary on that for the group? So I, as I said before, we're a fiduciary. I have always operated as a fiduciary, always worked for clients as a fiduciary. I would only personally be able to invest for clients in an asset that is, um, uh, has, you know, is, is, not, is not that speculative. So for me, that is, and most, you know, I think professional investors, that is one where it is independent, if we're talking about cryptocurrency, it is independent from a central authority. Its value moves up and down widely. It is really speculative and based upon the next person buying or selling that security from you. And the central authority in this case being like the US government or any government, right. yeah. So when you buy a stock, and, and this is just for simple purposes, right? You may buy a stock, pick Apple, Facebook, right? Whatever stock you're going to buy, you may buy it for two reasons. One, you think it's a, um, a good investment for long-term and that at some point, somebody else will buy that stock for you at a higher price. Or you, you're buying that stock in that company because maybe they're paying you an income stream. But that stock, that company has to do quarterly updates through the SEC, through the government, and there is a regulatory body that is monitoring the value of that company and how they report. Same goes for the bonds and for the treasuries, um, even the real estate market and your retirement accounts, right? There is some governing entity that is overseeing those assets. So is your, at this point of crypto. Yeah. Yeah. And then um, I, I think I know the answer, but just, I feel compelled to ask this question. So there's folks like, I think the Winkle, the Winklevoss twins or whatever, who are, trying to do the equivalent of like an index fund, you know, so index funds that, that, you know, the traditional ones would track the S&P 500 or, you know, the tech stock market or something, but I guess you can get an index fund that's tracking some kind of crypto. So I'm assuming your answer would be the same. That's slightly less risk on something that's also speculative. Correct. Correct. Yeah. yeah. Okay. I mean, Debbie, if you have free money and you you want to go to Vegas and you want to play around with it, it's more like gambling. <laughs> it's more like gambling. It's more like, and a lot of people say, well, I think the stock market is speculative. And this was something, not an argument, but a woman who said, you know, I just can't invest in the U.S. stock market. I'm afraid it's going to go to zero. And I said, okay, well, let me let me take a step back. The S and P 500, which is tracking the biggest 500 companies, right? Uh, in the U.S., and I read her the top 10 companies, and, you know, they're companies that we all know, and that 23% of the S&P are made up of these top 10 companies, and so I said, you know, do you really think these companies are going bankrupt? I said, well, the S&P 500, you'd have to, for that to go to zero, you'd have to have 500 companies <laughs> basically wash their hands and go bankrupt. Um, very simple terms, but um, there are enough checks and balances in place and quarterly updates and I think regulatory bodies, you know, overseeing the U.S. stock market. Mm -hmm. so, and we've seen large swings in the stock prices, right, based on consumers, based on retail investors' fear. Um, but when you think back about the fundamentals of the companies, the valuation should be closer to what the valuation should be close to what those are. Correct. Our closing minute or two, Allison, um, you know, you, you, you alluded to the fact that men and women are socialized differently. So women have maybe uh, I don't know what your word, words would be, but it could be a more risk-averse approach to um, finances and investing. But do you have any kind of parting with words of her? For That's what I would talk about in this community for, for women is, in this um, 
having these conversations again with people you respect, um, whether they're you know in your community you work with, asking other people who have done things right, or at least you've th seen them do things right. They just bought a house. Having those conversations, I think, around money, um, making them not so taboo, certainly help us in the language. And the more we know, the more receptive we are to actually going out and investing. Um, it is one where far too often I, I've spoken to women and they just, they're sitting in cash month after month, year after year, because they can't take that first step. And so if that's it, I, I you know, I use the Nike phrase, just do it. You can start small. And that's what I think some of the benefit to the robo advisors offer. You can start small. Is it $25 a month? Is it $100? And, and watching something and tracking it and then understanding, okay, what do I own? Am I comfortable adding more to it? But um, sitting on the sidelines and, and keeping so much money in cash, right? Unless you absolutely need that cash is, is not um, helping us in the long run in terms of women. By the time we get to retirement, again, it's like we're, we're retiring with one third the money that men have. Yeah, it's, uh, it reminds me of in, in my work in corporate innovation, you know, sometimes I have to remind people that um, when there's a scary decision about whether to take on a new business or a new product or solution, you know, if you're being risk averse, it could be like, well, maybe the safer thing to do is to not do anything. But like in investing, the safest thing is maybe not to, um, you know, to, to fall, fall victim to that instinct of doing nothing because that actually might be the more harmful thing over time. Right. And with that, I think we're coming up on time. Denise, did you want to, thank you everybody for your questions. We really appreciate it. We got to most of them. Um, Denise, did you want to uh, have any parting words of wisdom here? I just want to say thank you to everyone. I mean, this, this is a great conversation. Thank you, Debbie, so much for leading this and Allison for imparting your wonderful words of wisdom. Um, we're delighted to have you both back again and just, and thank you for everyone who joined us today. And, um, that's pretty much it. Just want to wish everybody a wonderful rest of their afternoon and hope to see you at other Silicon Valley forum events. Great. Well, thank you, Allison. Thank you, Denise. Thanks everybody for joining. Thank, thank you. you.